Welcome everyone to first annual science symposium. This is where we are going. We'll wait a minute or two as everyone is gathering and logging on. Also, if you have any questions during our presentation, we have a chat or a question function and we, we can reply you over there. If we do not get time, we have a breakout session right after this presentation and we can meet you uh, during that session. And in addition, we also have a poster related to this presentation. We'll be just waiting for another minute now. I think we can get started now. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I would like to start this talk uh, of risk versus hazard with this picture and a question. That what are the chances that two cars will hit each other on the road like this, or an accident will be caused between two cars? I think looking at the picture, the answer is relatively simple, that the chances are very low considering low volume of cars on these type of roads. And hence, while hazard uh, is there, due, is always there that you know a collision can happen when cars are around on such roads, due to the low exposure, or in this case, the low volume of cars, we have low risk. Now, what about this picture of New York City what are the chances that two cars will hit each other or there is an accident due to collision? I personally think the chances are pretty high in this image as compared to the previous one. Like last picture, hazard is there because the chances of two cars collision will be there on roads like these. But because of high exposure, and in this case, high volume of cars, there is high risk. That is, there are chances, the high chances that two cars will collide each other or ca cause an accident. So with that background, my name is Kaushal Zoshi and with my two colleagues, Holger Mostakas and Dan Selechnik, we'll be presenting on risk versus hazard, read across strategy and a case study. The talk or the presentation will focus on a basic framework of risk versus hazard, followed by the role of read across strategy, which will be covered by Holger. And finally, a case study, which will be covered by Dan Selechny. Now for next few slides, I'll be talking about basic framework and where do we see the risk part and the hazard part in that framework. This part might be really uh, very basic for many of you, and it might be a really new uh, topic for some of you. Little bit in depth of topic will be covered later on when we discuss read across strategy and the case study. So uh, talking about basic framework, uh, risk assessment, risk management, and research can be connected to form a framework. So what exactly is included in research part? We have uh, risk assessment, risk management, research. So what exactly uh, would we have in research part? <laughs> there can be new mechanistic understanding based on which we might explore new testing methods or in some cases there might be a follow-up required based on some known mechanism 
in some cases uh, metabolite can have an impact which sometimes triggers further testing so basically there can be different things happening uh, when we are looking into the new me mechanistic understanding then we have new methodologies where we know that new testing methods have been developed and validated some will have an impact on how we carry out our safety assessment and there can be some methods which act as screening tools and there might be some which will help which will be helpful to reduce let's say animal testing now one of the best example i can give uh, here for new methodologies is that researchers are now trying to validate a lot of new in vitro methods let's say for systemic and repeated dose toxicity in future we actually might be using new methods to carry out research than what we are doing right now so there can be a change in uh, way we do things in in the future next what do we see in the what all things might be covered in risk assessment part so for risk assessment we have as noted here we have hazard identification and exposure assessment hazard identification is basically trying to identify cause and effect relationship for example in our case what are chances uh, when we do safety assessments at reform basically what are chances that a fragrance material can cause a kidney injury or what are chances that a chemical can cause some histopathological changes so those things are sort of included in hazard identification now a chemical structure solubility stability ph sensitivity electrophilicity volatility and chemical reactivity can be important information for hazard identification and these things sometimes can already be available for any given material or ingredient <clears throat> then risk assessment uh, another part uh, is exposure assessment as mentioned here in the slide the primary objective of exposure assessment are to determine the source type magnitude and duration of the contact of chemical of interest now why is it really important uh, because risk will not occur in absence of exposure one of the other factor not mentioned here on the slide is dose response that can also be part of uh, risk assessment in general and that can also influence hazard identification now we have a third part here that is risk management what all things can be included in uh, risk management we have development of regulatory options and we will also have a uh, general evaluation now i can share something that we do here at reform uh, let's say for repeated dose toxicity development and reproductive toxicity skin sensitization or phototoxicity basically from all these toxicological areas we derive uh, if we identify a skin sensitizer we derive maximum acceptable concentrations mac values and they can be part of risk management these values uh, maximum acceptable concentration values are forwarded to international fragrance association which is also known as ifra and after that ifra is responsible for risk management and that's how uh, we kind of play a role in the risk management side of it further apart from development and development of regulatory options risk management can also be performed by general evaluation now what exactly do we mean by that uh, this may mean that uh, the evaluation of public health economic social context for risk management options and that may further lead to decisions and actions now how are uh, as i mentioned this is supposed to be a framework now how, do, how are these three uh, connected to each other now new research is always going to change the way uh, the risk assessment will be performed and sometimes uh, an example that uh, i can share for this is uh, research need is 
can be what we have seen happening with the ban of animal testing. So a lot of in vitro methods are now being analyzed and being validated. In future, there will be new research which might affect the way we do risk assessment. So basically, research will feed into you know the way we do risk assessment, and in turn, whenever there is a new need, as I mentioned regarding new in vitro methods or NAMs being introduced, that is <clears throat> that might trigger more research to be done. So uh, these two things are interconnected, and whenever we have any hazard identified, then it can feed into risk management and that way uh, uh, regulatory options can be explored if there is some hazard. As this presentation is about mostly about uh, risk and hazard, uh, for the rest part of my presentation, I'll be focusing on the middle portion as highlighted in red, uh, which, is, which will be risk identification and exposure assessment. So the key steps of risk assessment include hazard identification and exposure assessment. As mentioned earlier, hazard identification is basically trying to identify cause and effect relationship. Another part of risk assessment is exposure ex assessment. And one of the primary objective of exposure assessment are to determine source, the type, magnitude, and duration of contact of chemical of interest. And once we have hazard identification and exposure assessment, we can characterize the risk as mentioned in the slide here. Now, how exactly will that be important? Uh, what uh, basically risk characterization will consider the nature, estimated incidence, and reversibility of adverse effect in given population. It can also determine how robust the evidence is how certain evaluation is if there are susceptible populations which are characterized for example age or genetic variation uh, can actually drive some of the results so there might be susceptible population there and if there are any relevant mechanism of action involved so all those things uh, will be covered in risk characterization For the next part, uh, I'll be breaking down uh, the hazard identification and exposure assessment as it is highlighted in the red, as that those might be the two important uh, point of discussions when we uh, are distinguishing or talking about risk and hazard. So an important criteria uh, in hazard identification is to check if chemical or fragrance material, let's say, can cause an adverse health effect. There can be animal bioassays, as mentioned here. For example, uh, to give an example, in systemic toxicity, we have OECD-408, or in development and reproductive toxicity, we have OECD-414, which are prenatal developmental toxicity study, or OECD-443, which is extended one generation studies. Now these tests can basically help in hazard identification, respectively based on what toxicological area you're looking for. Further, there can be in vitro tests, which can also identify hazard. For example, there are in vitro tests available for skin sensitization. Uh, for genotoxicity, we can identify hazard based on, let's say, AIMS test, in vitro micronucleus test, just to uh, give a few examples. And lastly, uh, structure activity analysis can be another way we identify hazard, where we can use read across analysis. Uh, read across analysis is quite a known concept and it will be covered uh, in the next part of this presentation. Or we can also use in silico models like, for example, QSAR toolbox, ToxTree, just to give a few examples. And that may assist in identifying hazard. So overall, there can be different ways uh, that we can, that helps us to identify the hazard. Now, this is the hazard part that is regarding exposure assessment. Exposure is basically the level to which consumers interact with an ingredient. 
As we see here in the image, ingredients can come from different sources, lipstick, nail polish, toothpaste, soaps, shampoos, etc. And we can get values for total systemic exposure with help of some tools. One such model is CREM Refirm Aggregate Exposure Model. It basically uses deterministic and probabilistic exposure data to describe real life consumer exposure to a specific fragrance material. And with all this information that we get uh, from the model, uh, we'll be able to determine total systemic exposure in mg per kg per day. That would be for systemic endpoint. We can do similar thing for inhalation uh, where we can get inhalation exposure as well. And as already mentioned earlier, CREM reform ex uh, aggregate exposure model will use deterministic and probabilistic exposure uh, to describe real life consumer exposure uh, uh, to a specific fragrance ingredient. Now I'm just uh, sharing an example here uh, on how exactly it would look like uh, the hazard part and how we do safety assessment or risk assessment, how would it exactly look like in a, uh, and reform safety assessment, basically, if we are uh, going through a repeated dose toxicity endpoint. Here, Material X shows treatment related adverse effects from an OECD 408 90 day repeated dose toxicity study in Sprague Dolly Rats. As we can see here, the different doses uh, control group 50 mg per kg, 200, and 600. At 600 mg per kg, uh, there are significant defects seen in absolute relative liver weights, higher fat content in hepatic cells, and some histopathological changes as compared to the control. We also see some significant changes in liver weights in males and females at 200. With that basic information, uh, we can derive an OL to be 50 mg per kg per day for this particular material X. Now, let's say, for example, total systemic exposure is 0 0.001 mg per kg per day. So in this particular example that we saw in previous slide, we can say that material X presents a hazard, but if the exposure is kept low, as in this case, we have it to be 0 0.001 mg per kg per day, at which there are no adverse effects observed, and in that case, the risk will be low. So if Noel is considered 50, the exposure is low. We have margin of safety uh, greater than 100 in this case, and there is a relatively low risk. Margin of safety being 100 is accepted by uh, relatively uh, uh, many regulatory uh, uh, agencies. 10 can be uh, uh, individual variations, and 10x can be for animal to human changes. So at Refirm, we conduct, uh, as shown in the previous example, we conduct risk-based safety assessment. Uh, here is just a, a, a screenshot from the criteria document uh, that Refirm had published. And here we have a repeated dose section where we describe, uh, as mentioned in the previous slide, studies like OECD 408, OECD 407, which deal with systemic toxicity. So those, uh, all the studies are described in the period of toxicity section. And next, uh, we also assess exposure. Exposure assessment is done based on the CREM reform aggregate exposure tool. And then based on the NOEL and based on the exposure, we can calculate the margin of safety or margin of exposure and determine if that fragrance ingredient is safe or no. So that was pretty much about some of the basics of risk versus hazard and how uh, we do some of the things here at Refirm. Next up is uh, Holger Mustakas, who will go through read across strategy with respect to risk versus hazard. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for the introdu introduction, Kaushal. Hello. My name is Holger Mostakis, and today I will be discussing our read across strategy with respect to relative risk and hazard. To begin with, I would like to discuss how we at RIFM have developed our read across strategy over time. So in the past, RIFM used to assess large groups of chemicals. These large groups were based on their most significant structural feature, 
something like grouping all of the aldehydes together or grouping all of the esters together. This, however, did not strongly consider other features in the chemicals. A very simplified example of this can be shown on the side here with these different shapes. All of these shapes are blue. If we consider that the most striking structural feature, we could group all of these together. And of course, it is an important part of it, but there are many other things such as the size of their different sides, the number of different sides they have, or their angles. Considering those can more finely tune the sort of grouping that we could create. In addition, endpoint specific concerns were not addressed in these groups. And again, were very much simply based on the one most significant structural feature. RIFM has further developed their use of reader cross from those large groups through the use of clustering. RIFM went about clustering its entire, ca entire catalog of chemicals by assigning structural activity groups to all of them. These structural activity groups have a list of all the different structural features in the chemical of interest, starting with the most important and going through. By assigning these, we could then group all of the chemicals that have the same structural activity group together. When we did this, it formed much more tight and scientifically sound clusters that we knew could be very well um, connected to one another. This effort has been published in Chemical Research and Toxicology back in 2020. Rivum has continued to develop Reader Cross with use of endpoint specific frameworks. At Rifum, we've found that more than just considering the structure of the two materials when considering Reader Cross, we must consider the endpoint that we wish to use the Reader Cross for. Different endpoints have different considerations that are important, which can greatly increase the number of viable and appropriate read across options for a certain material. Through evaluating the thousands of chemicals for our safety assessment program, a series of rule-based schemes for each endpoint was created. We can then use these rules to search through databases and then select the most appropriate read across for any particular human health endpoint. For example, in genotoxicity and skin sensitization, one of the most important features is reactivity. If we're able to have the same reactive groups in both the target and the read across analog, it is likely that the read across would be appropriate. Whereas more conservative rules would need to be used in an endpoint such as local respiratory toxicology, since the mode of action and the mechanisms are less well known. So we'd want to have greater structural similarity on top of that reactivity. This effort will soon be published in Chemical Research and Toxicology. With our current read across strategy in mind, the two materials I'd like to focus on are isoeugenol and methyl eugenol. Isoeugenol and methyl eugenol, as shown on the slide here, are members of the phenylpropenes a chemical family defined by a six carbon aromatic phenyl group and a three carbon propene tail. Phenylpropenes are phenylpropanoid volatiles synthesized through phenylalanine and tyrosine metabolism in plants. Both isoeugenol and methyl eugenol are pale yellow colored oily liquids with a spice clove scent and are found in many spices and plants naturally. Looking at these two structures, there's a lot of similarities that you can note between them, and they look fairly similar. However, there are key differences that can be noted between these two materials. Highlighted by these circles, we can see, starting with the blue circle, in isoeugenol, we have an alcohol group, where in methyl eugenol, we have a methoxy group. 
Furthermore, by the darker blue circle, ice eugenol has a vinylene group compared to the vinyl group shown in methyl eugenol. While seemingly not to be that different, these functionalities result, can result in very different chemistries that are available to each one of these two materials. Furthermore, <clears throat> considering those small differences, we can see that this Tanimoto score comparison for these chemicals is only 56.86%. What this means is that when you took, take these two structures, only 56.86% of them are similar to each other. Now, there are some issues with relying solely on Tanimoto score as a metric for comparison, which we will discuss in a different session during the science symposium. But it is definitely a good starting point and way to think about the materials to begin with. These differences in structure have also been reflected in the RIFM grouping method, which is with a clustering that I spoke about in the beginning that we published back in 2020. Both of these materials have different structural activity groups that address and signature that define the clusters that we use to compare the materials. So you can see isoeugenol starts in the phenylcresol group, where methyl eugenol starts with ethers. This difference is significant and would result in these being in very different clusters in the overall clustering scheme, noting that they are not that similar. Now, moving away from structure, though certainly based on structure, we can put these through various simulators and see what alerts are found for them. Starting with tox tree, we see that isoeugenol and methyl eugenol have different alerts present in this tool. Isoeugenol is negative for non-genotoxic non carcinogenicity, genotoxic carcinogenicity, and in vitro mutagenicity whereas methyl eugenol is negative for non-genotoxic carcinogenicity, but positive for genotoxic carcinogenicity and in vitro mutagenicity. These alerts are based on the structure. So those small structural differences that I noted earlier are having an effect when we're looking at these predicted alerts. Furthermore, if we look at the QSAR toolbox, another simulator, we can see that isoeugenol is negative for the in vitro mutagenicity and carcinogenicity, both genotoxic and non-genotoxic, here, but positive for in vivo mutagenicity. Methyl eugenol is positive for all three. We can then look at the predicted metabolism to also show differences between these two materials. Shown here is the metabolism pathway predicted by Oasis Times using the rat liver S9 model. Here we're showing isoeugenol. Unfortunately, it's a little small due to the size of the metabolism pathway. But if we look at this overall uh, graphic and then compare it to the methyl eugenol pathway here, you can see very clearly that they are very different. The amount of metabolites formed are different, and the types are also different as well. This leads into the differences between these two materials. So taking all of what I've just said in summary, while isoeugenol and methyl appear to have high structural similarity, key portions of their structure differ. Again, pointing to the difference in the alcohol versus methoxy group, and the vinylene versus vinyl group. This greatly reduces their similarity and their Tanimoto score is only 56.86%. We can further show the differences through predicted toxicological profiles and metabolism pathways. The alerts shown between these two materials were different between in both the tox tree and the QSAR toolbox models. The metabolism by rat liver S9 in Oasis Times 
was also very different. At RIFM, when we consider read across, we look at structure, alerts, and metabolism to determine if a read across should be valid. Based on those qualifications, this really wouldn't be. So we would say that these materials should not be considered appropriate read across analogs from one another due to all of these features. And so now, I'd like to move on and move and hand this over to Dan, who will present a case study using the toxicological data for isoeugenol and methyl eugenol, which will add on to the overall story of why these two materials should not be considered read across for each other. Thank you all for your attention. Thanks, Holger, for introducing the materials in this case study, isoeugenol and methyl eugenol. I will now discuss the available toxicological data on them that assess their potential for carcinogenicity. The National Toxicology Program, or NTP, has tested these two materials with similar study designs. In both cases, the studies had a two-year duration, administered the substance using gavage, and monitored the effects on a sample of 50 F344N rats per sex per dose. However, the two studies used different vehicles for gavage, and there were slight differences in the dosing. The lowest treatment dose of 37 milligrams per kilogram per day was only tested for methyl eugenol. The highest treatment dose of 300 milligrams per kilogram per day was tested for both materials, but it was only administered normally for isoeugenol, whereas in methyl eugenol, it was used as a stop exposure group. Finally, the control and stop exposure group in the methyl eugenol study included 10 extra rats each. Here, we see the results from isoeugenol administration. Naturally, for a two-year study, mortality occurred at all doses, including the control. However, the mortality rate was not significantly different at any dose level. The only potentially carcinogenic effects observed were small incidences of benign or malignant thymoma and mammary gland carcinoma exclusively in male rats at the highest dose. The results from methyl eugenol administration are quite different. Although mortality occurred at all doses, including the control, mortality rate was significantly increased in males and females at 150 and 300 milligrams per kilogram per day, with complete mortality of males observed at these doses. Furthermore, a variety of carcinogenic effects are seen with significantly increased incidence in males and females even at the lowest dose of 37 milligrams per kilogram per day. These effects include liver neoplasms, neuroendocrine tumors of the glandular stomach kidney neoplasms, malignant mesothelioma, mammary gland fibroadenoma, and subcutaneous fibroma and fibrosarcoma. Based on the clear differences in results, the NTP drew different conclusions on the carcinogenic potential from isoeugenol and methyl eugenol. Isoeugenol was deemed to have equivocal evidence of carcinogenicity in males based on the small incidences of thymoma and mammary gland carcinoma, and no evidence of carcinogenicity in females. Methyl eugenol, however, was deemed to have clear evidence of carcinogenicity in males and females based on the array of neoplasms observed at all doses. Similarly to what was done in rats, the NTP also tested isoeugenol and methyl eugenol with similar des study designs. Once again, the studies both had a two-year duration, administered the substance using gavage, and monitored the effects on a sample of 50 B6 C3 F1 mice per sex per dose. The vehicles were different and there were slight differences in the dosing. The lowest treatment dose of 37 milligrams per kilogram per day was only tested for methyl eugenol and the highest treatment dose of 300 milligrams per kilogram per day was only tested for isoeugenol.
results from isoeugenol administration were different in mice than in rats. Unlike in rats, mortality rate was increased in male mice at the highest dose of 300 milligrams per kilogram per day. There was also a significant increase in incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma or adenoma in males at all treatment doses. There were also small incidences of histiocytic sarcoma in females at 75 and 150 milligrams per kilogram per day, with the effect achieving statistical significance only at the highest dose of 300 milligrams per kilogram per day. The results from methyl eugenol administration were fairly similar in rats and mice. Mortality rate in female mice was increased at every dose. Hepatocellular carcinoma or adenoma was significantly increased in the males and females at every dose. Neuroendocrine tumors were also observed in males at the high dose of 150 milligrams per kilogram per day. Based on these results, the NTP once again drew different conclusions for isoeugenol and methyleugenol for mice. They deemed isoeugenol to have clear evidence of carcinogenicity in males based on the increased incidence of hepatocellular adenoma and carcinoma at every dose level, and equivocal evidence in females based on small incidences of histiocytic sarcoma. However, methyl eugenol was found to have clear evidence of carcinogenicity in males and females based on hepatocellular adenoma and carcinoma in both sexes at every dose, and the neuroendocrine tumors in males at the highest dose. From all the conclusions across male and female rats and mice, the only one that isoeugenol and methyleugenol seemingly have in common is the clear evidence of carcinogenicity in male mice. However, in light of historical control data on male B6C3F1 mice, the relevance to human health of the hepatocellular adenomas and carcinomas caused in male mice by isoeugenol has been questioned. Specifically, male B6C3F1 mice are known for their historically wide incidence range of sp spontaneous hepatocellular adenomas and carcinomas, even with no treatment substance. In Gavage studies using corn oil, which is the vehicle used in the isoeugenol studies, the historical control range for these liver, tu liver tumors is 56 to 66 percent. Across all administration routes, the range is even wider, being 20 to 84 percent. When comparing this with the incidence rates of hepatocellular adenoma and carcinoma seen in the isoeugenol study, it is questionable whether these tumors arose solely due to treatment or if it was a species and sex-specific effect. This possibility is further emphasized by the complete lack of liver tumors seen in females at any dose in contrast to the high incidence of liver tumors in male and female mice associated with every dose level of methyl eugenol. Finally, these liver tumors were not seen at all in male nor female rats treated with isoeugenol, whereas they were seen in both male and female rats treated with every dose of methyl eugenol, just like the mice. Diving further into expert guidance on the hepatocellular adenoma and carcinoma in male mice, the Global Harmonized System, or GHS, states that an increase in a single organ that is particularly susceptible to spontaneous tumors is not sufficient to classify that substance as a carcinogen. Furthermore, the European Chemicals Agency, or ECHA, states that the appearance of only spontaneous tumors, especially if they appear only at high dose levels, may be sufficient to downgrade a classification from category 1b to category 2, or even no classification. Where the only available tumor data are liver tumors in a certain sensitive strains of mice, without any supplementary evidence, the substance may not be classified in any of the categories. Going off of this guidance, it would appear still appropriate to classify methyl eugenol as a carcinogen, but not isoeugenol. 
Unsurprisingly, then, isoeugenol has been classified differently than methyl eugenol across organizations. The Flavor Extract Manufacturers Association, or FEMA, has listed isoeugenol as GRASS, which stands for Generally Regarded as Safe. Methyl eugenol was also once placed on this list, but its status was revoked in 2016. The Joint Expert Committee on Food Additive, or JECFA, lists isoeugenol as having no safety concern at current levels. In contrast, the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment of the California EPA has listed methyl eugenol as a Proposition 65 carcinogen. The European Commission's Scientific Committee on Food has characterized methyl eugenol as genotoxic and carcinogenic. The Internal Agency for Research on Cancer, or IARC, classifies methyl eugenol as a possible class 2b carcinogen, whereas isoeugenol has no such classification. Now we'll quickly return to one of Koshal's slides from earlier. Up to this point in the case study, we have only discussed hazard, and as we can see, the levels of hazard posed by isoeugenol and methyl eugenol are quite different, and it is not appropriate to group these substances together for anything related to safety assessment. And that was shown both in the chemistry data uh, shown by Holger and the toxicological data that I just presented. However, risk is not determined solely by hazard, but also by exposure. So how can we limit exposure to these materials such that the risk is low enough for both of them? When a material requires risk management, the RIFM safety assessment team performs a set of calculations to determine the maximum acceptable concentration or MAC values. MAC values take into account both systemic endpoints like repeated dose and reproductive toxicity and local endpoints like skin sensitization and sometimes phototoxicity. On the systemic side, the first step is to take the lowest conservative no observed adverse effect level or no AL from the available data and to convert it to a reference dose using uncertainty factors. A reference dose is a benchmark dose used to calculate the systemic upper limit of acceptable concentration. Typically, for non-carcinogenic materials, the uncertainty factor value used to convert a NOAL to a reference dose is 100. This 100 comprises a value of 10 for animal to human extrapolation multiplied by another factor of 10 for inter-individual variation. However, for carcinogenic materials, a much higher uncertainty factor value of 10,000 is used. Thus, reference doses for carcinogenic materials will end up being orders of magnitude lower than reference doses for most non-carcinogenic materials. Isoeugenol is not considered to be carcinogenic, and thus the uncertainty factor value of 100 was used for that NOAL to reference dose conversion. While methyl eugenol is considered to be carcinogenic, <coughs> and thus the uncertainty factor value of 10,000 was used for the NOAL to reference dose conversion. As you can see, the reference dose value for methyl eugenol is much lower than that of isoeugenol. Once the reference dose values are obtained, they are factored in with no effect levels from the skin sensitization endpoint to calculate MAC values. <clears throat> These MAC values are then incorporated into IFRA standards, which regulate allowable exposure levels of certain fragrance ingredients. Based on the vast difference in reference dose between the two materials, the exposure levels of methyl eugenol will be much more limited than those of iso eugenol. This finally brings us to risk. 
We've established that the hazards posed by isoeugenol are much lower relative to those posed by methyl eugenol. And thus, if they had equal usage levels, then methyl eugenol would be much riskier. However, thanks to limits placed on exposure by RIFM's MAT calculations and the resulting IFRA standards, this is not the case. Usage levels of methyl eugenol are severely limited to levels low enough that we are confident that they can be used safely. Thus, due to the differential limits placed on exposure between the two materials, both isoeugenol and methyl eugenol can be low risk materials. To wrap things up, we first reiterate that isoeugenol and methyl eugenol are often lumped together when considering safety assessment due to their structural similarity. However, grouping materials for tools such as Redacross requires considerations of much more than just structural similarity. This becomes evident when you examine the toxicological profiles of both materials and discover that methyl eugenol is much more hazardous than isoeugenol. However, despite their toxicological differences, if usage levels of each material are regulated appropriately, then both materials can be low risk. This now concludes our presentation. Just to remind you, there is a poster associated with our presentation, and you can download it from within this presentation space or in the exhibit hall, which has everyone's posters in separate booths. Now, I would like to invite everyone to our breakout session and direct you to the agenda tab of this event. Thanks so much to everyone for listening and asking questions. Please now join us in the breakout session where you can ask us more questions directly. Thank you.